Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I'd like to preach you a message entitled, The Mystery. When you come to the word mystery in the word of God, especially in the New Testament, you find that it's something that was hidden that is now revealed. You know, sort of like a murder mystery or something that you may have read in times past or seen a movie or something. You don't know what happens at the beginning and then it's revealed. When God uses the word, it's very similar to that. He kept it quiet for a while, but then he revealed it. Many of the things that the prophets and those in the Old Testament didn't know at all, we have a perfect understanding of. We, it's a, a real privileged position that we're in to understand the mysteries. And I'd like to preach to you tonight about the greatest mystery of all of history. Would you stand, please? Let's read these verses. The Bible says in verse number three, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now look up here, beginning verse number 9 through verse number, the first part of 13a is what I'm going to preach on tonight. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit sealing in another message, but we're going to come up through from 9 to 13a. So put your thinking cap on and listen to this. Here we go. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, wherein, or excuse me, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. Father, we come now to your precious word. We don't want to allow any word to fall on the ground that hasn't been thought through. And I just pray, Father, that you would use the word to change us tonight. Lord, may you do what is powerful in this place. I pray, Father, that you would help us to lift up the word, lift up the, the God who wrote the word. And I pray, Lord, that we would just, uh, just praise you for what you have done through Christ. And I pray that you would bless the words. Help us, Lord. Grow us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. This chapter is one of the most encouraging and clearest passages in all of the Bible on soteriology, which is the study of salvation. Sometimes when I get discouraged, I go back and I read things like Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 1, and I remember what God has done for us. The key uh, words in, in verse number 3 and verse number 4, as we have seen, talk about the spiritual blessings we have been blessed with. And all spiritual blessings, thinking back over this, do you realize that God has heaped on you? He's given you everything possible in His great creat creativity that He could give you. It wasn't just a matter that you've been given a ticket out of hell. That's, it, it's so much more than that. In His vast creativity and, and in, his, in His vast pouring out of His grace, everything that He could do for you that was good in light of eternity forever and ever to exalt you, to glorify you, He did. He didn't hold back one good thing in eternity from what he could pour on you. Now you say every day seems awful rough. Every day is awful rough until the day that we see Christ. But I want to tell you from that point on, folks, you need to encourage yourself, compel yourself, and to stir yourself that it will be worth it all when you see Jesus. That everything that you see in this chapter 1 will be poured upon you in great and incredible ways that we will be kings and priests to our God forever reigning alongside of the Lord Jesus Christ in a glory that no king in this earth ever knew and a glory that no queen in a rich, in a riches, in riches that no king or queen, King Solomon, never thought of the riches that you're going to have in heaven. And I don't just mean monetarily. I mean the incredible glory and majesty of how God the Father is going to exalt, exalt you simply because you trusted in Christ. 
The unbelievable truth of God's will and salvation occurs over and over here in the passage to convince us that God is good, that God is love, and that God is the purest grace. There is a grace in God that none of us have. We come to, the po to a point of grace in our, our, our lives. We come to a point of kindness to other people. We like to think that we are nice when we allow people to get away with things or the, the neighbor breaks the mower so we don't charge him for it or whatever it, what it will be, you know, those things. We like to think of ourselves as gracious, gracious. Folks, our graciousness doesn't come anywhere close, anywhere near God's graciousness. You can't compare yourself. You can't compare God's grace to the grace that is on this earth. There's nothing like it here. And the, the, the passage, as it rolls through, it's like a giant poem. In fact, it is the longest sentence in all of the Bible is found here in Ephesians chapter 1. It goes on and on and on, semicolons and colons and commas, and just goes on and on and on. It's like a great rolling river showing us the great depth of the grace of God. We see this truth uh, that it was God's will and salvation to do the best that he could ever do for us by his own choice by the realization that he of his own accord initiated your salvation. He of his own accord made it possible. As the sheep was running away, the shepherd chased the sheep without any contribution of your own, but, uh, without any attractiveness in you that caused him to do it. And again, we pointed this out. It's not a matter that God was attracted to you because of something good in you. His salvation to you is all of what he did. There was no halfway. You didn't meet him halfway. That idea is ridiculous. You, he came after you. It cost him a great deal to carry out his gracious will. It made him vulnerable to have children who would sometimes hurt and disappoint him. It committed him forever to share the glories of heaven with created beings that were rescued by the cost of the torture of his precious only begotten son. Do you realize that? Something will change in all of eternity before uh, mankind ever were created. God didn't need to share his glory with anybody. The, the angels were beings that only sang of his glory. In the last days, he will share. He invites you and I to be exalted with him. We are his royal children of the royal family that will be exalted with God, with Christ. That's good. It cost him something. And here is the beauty. That was his gracious will toward us. He decided that it was going to cost him something. And he was willing to do it. Verse number four, we see these in words like this. Verse number four, according says he has chosen us in him, sh showing his will, the expression that he desired, he planned it, having predestinated us. In verse five, verse five, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse six, to the praise of his grace. Verse seven, according to the riches of his grace. Verse eight, he hath abounded toward us. Verse nine, mystery of his will, good pleasure that he hath purposed in himself. Verse number 11, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Over and over and over there, like eight or nine times, it becomes it becomes very clear that God had a great plan. Do you know that Adam and Eve sinning against God did not take God by surprise? Do you know God had a great plan? All these statements point to the fact that God is so good in choosing to pull us out of the pit that we can never pull ourselves out of. He willed it because His character is grace. And we're going to see this at the end, that that is very, very important, this matter of him knowing what was coming, this matter of him being sovereign, this matter of what does it mean, what does history mean, and people are saying things like, what's the meaning of life? We're going to see the, the unfolding of that mystery tonight. We've seen a, a list here in this passage of spiritual blessings God has lavished on us. We've seen four of them. We stand before God holy, verse number four, and without blame before Him in love. That's our standing before Him. It's uh, verse number five shows we are adopted children of God by Jesus Christ. You remember that sermon that Jesus Christ went into the orphanage and found the ugliest kid and, and, re, and poured upon him all the love and you're the ugliest kid? I know that because your spouse told, no, 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 that God in his great love lavished his love on us, adopted us as children, and there was nothing that attracted uh, us uh, to, or him to us. We saw in verse number six that we are accepted in the beloved with those that God's love loves. We are now there. We saw in verse number seven, we have redemption 
through Jesus Christ's blood. We talked about the slave market. We talked about the purchase out of it. The price was the blood of Christ. Nothing can wash away our sin but the blood. Tonight we'd like to see two more of these blessings. Verse number five, I want you to notice, uh, or excuse me, point number five, or blessing number five. In verse number nine it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation, don't let that word scare you, it just means the management or the administration of the fullness of time. When God decided he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. As I told you, the fall of man did not take God by surprise. Sometimes we treat God like a man, like we didn't know, like he didn't know that he created uh, uh, if he created man that they would sin against him. Of course he knew they were going to sin against him. He did not make them sin. He did not choose for them to sin. There's no evil in God. He doesn't tempt any man, the Word of God says. He doesn't do that at all. He cannot be tempted with evil, evil neither tempteth he any man. You cannot say it was the will of God that man sinned, but you can say he knew that they would sin, and he provided a plan of grace beyond that. And the plan of grace beyond it would greatly glorify him, even though man had rebelled against him. The fall didn't take man by surprise. The destruction of the world by a flood was in his plan. The calling of Abraham and choosing the Jews as his chosen people was all by design. The law was his hired school teacher to bring us to grace. He sent prophets to predict the future, all in his plan that they would be rejected. Many of them would be killed. His son was born, uh, born a man at the exact right moment in time when the fullness of time came. God sent down his son, born of a virgin. You remember this verse? His church grew from a mustard seed to a thriving tree. What we are doing tonight, including the dessert fellowship, was part of his plan. The, the New, T New Testament local church fellowshiped and met together. He ordained the local church in these last times. He wrote the New Testament to reveal us something to us, the, something the prophets did not know. And it was the re revelation of the mystery that is found in verse number 9. What that mystery would be. Verse 8 says that he abounded or he lavished his grace on us in wisdom and prudence, intelligence, to understand what was in verse number 9. That the salvation that we have will be the greatest wrap up of all of the universe has ever known. And that is the gathering. A gathering of the people, the saints of God, like nothing you have ever imagined before. It is all, all of this history and the universe that we have is all going towards one thing. The will of God, Him sanctifying you, everything that He does in your life is all headed towards one day. A giant gathering. All who have trusted in Christ will be together in one place, in one time period, under one leader, Jesus Himself, for all eternity. Now I want you to imagine that. Sometimes we think of people, do you ever think of people of past generations, what it would be like? In heaven, folks, in this gathering, the mystery of his will, that this was all that what it was about before he ever made mankind, he knew that there would be this giant gathering and that forever and eternity he would share fellowship. He would share intimate fellowship with those of his grace. He knew this would happen. This is the meaning of life, I'm telling you. The mystery revealed in verse number 8, verse number 9, and verse number 10 is this giant gathering. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? Some of you have been in places where there have been a lot of believers. When I go back to the university, to BJ, I love to be at a Bible conference or whatever in the amphitorium where there's like 4,000 voices singing to the Lord. I realize everybody that's in that place is not saved. But I understand also that many of them are and they're singing from the heart. And I like to stop singing for just a moment and to listen as those voices swell and the beautiful then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art and how great thou art. And the, the song leader will stop the instruments and acapella 4,000 voices. Can you imagine 40 million voices? of the saved of all the ages, having been stripped of their sin natures and now standing in white linen in the perfect righteousness of Christ, singing at the top of their voices like angels could never sing. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Giant tears rolling of joy and praise to, to Jesus Christ himself. That's the gathering. That's the gathering. And that sends goosebumps through my entire body. 
and it's going to be like something you've never experienced before. And God did everything He did throughout all the ages for that moment so that in eternity He could spend intimate fellowship and receive dynamic praise from the vessels of grace, from you, from me. And it would exalt Him like nothing else could ever exalt Him. God never changes. Verse number 10 talks about when this is going to happen in the dispensation of the fullness of time. When is that? God never changes, but if you think through Bible history, you see that God dealt in different ways with mankind in different periods of time. His salvation has always been one thing. And don't ever, anybody ever let you tell, uh, to tell you that the, un, that the Old Testament saints were saved a different way than the New Testament saints. It was always the same thing. It was grace by faith. Grace by faith. When those... Jews came with their animal sacrifices. They were admitting that they could not save themselves. Those that were doing it, not out of religious works, but out of laying those lambs, slitting those lambs' throat, offering sometimes, if you're poor, uh, uh, birds and different things that, that uh, offering it. It was saying, I can't forgive myself. I trust on the grace of God. There was faith on their side. Grace on, did they understand all about Jesus Christ? Probably not. They did know the idea that there was a Redeemer coming at certain points in time, but it was always by grace through faith. But God at different times dealt with people through history through different uh, means or different management. They're called dispensation. If you, if you look through the Bible and you think through it, you see God working in different ways at different time periods. They've called, men have labeled this the dispensations. It's our word here in verse number 10. There was the age of innocence when uh, Adam and Eve were here. There were the age of conscience. That was before the flood. Age of government, age of promise, age of law, age of grace that we are now in. And someday, folks, there's going to be an age called the age of kingdom. The kingdom age. When all those things Jesus Christ was talking about, about the kingdom of, uh, of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like, okay? There's, we could preach all night about the kingdom of heaven, but someday there is a literal kingdom where Jesus Christ will be the king that we will enjoy. 40 million, 50 million, I don't know how many people have been saved throughout all the ages. Strong, all of us submitted to that wonderful king. Verse number 10 in Ephesians 1 speaks of this last dispensation. The fullness of time. It's the wrap-up of the will of God. God planned all history to build to that moment. It's like a symphony that's, that, that comes to a crescendo. And that crescendo is eternity when all the enemies of God have pushed down. And the last saint has prayed and asked Christ to be their Savior. And we're ushered into this eternity of the kingdom of God. An incredible time. The mystery. That is what we're all building to. That's what we're looking for. In his perfect timing, the rapture would occur, the tribulation will occur, the millennium will unfold that will begin the fulfillment, and after all evil is judged in the lake of fire, the fulfillment of this mystery will be complete. Old Testament saint, New Testament saint, man, woman, children, Jews of, and, and Gentiles alike, those saved before and after the rapture, those born during the millennium and saved, those alive in the millennium on the earth, and those dead in Christ that were in heaven that were brought down at the beginning of the millennium to rule with Christ, all the saved of God will rejoice as brothers and sisters together. You'll be standing there in that great and grand gathering. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it'll be like this. I believe that it, poss it, it possibly could. I believe we're going to communicate and talk. I mean, I don't think it's going to be that we're going to just be zombies just praising all of the time. But the person beside you, I, uh, you might... Uh, you might say, hello, ma'am, uh, what, you know, what is your name? My, name's, my name's Toby Whitmer. What's your name? My name's Mary. Mary. Oh, that's great. What's your last name? Well, I'm just Mary. Really? Um, what, what did you do on earth? I was the mother of Jesus. Really? Really? A few days later, a few, you know, 10,000 years or so, you know, you walk by Kind of burly figures walking along. Hello, how you doing? Toby's my name. What's your name? I'm Elijah. What's your last name? Tishbite. <laughs> Elijah Tishbite. What's your middle name, the? <laughs> See John the Baptist there too? What a time it's going to be, folks. What a time. What a glorious, incredible fellowshipping. What a time it's going to be. All the things of this life that we consider so valuable are just going to be a memory. 
God is crescendoing it all. It was His, it's the mystery of His will revealed right here in, number, in verse number 10. Look at it, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. That's the mystery of His will. We see chosen and will and predestinated the whole way through this chapter and we come like a giant crescendo bang. What is the mystery of His will? What is it that is going to be revealed? What is it that we're working for? Why did He chose us? Why did He bring us to Christ? Why did He call us? Why did He give us an opportunity to be saved? Why did He come after us like, she, uh, like sheep that had gone astray, a shepherd coming after us? Why are we blessed to hear the gospel? Why does He heap on all these things? Because He's going to gather us one day. He's going to gather us and it's going to be an incredible meeting. It was His will that we come to that place. It was His will that we all be gathered there. The big picture of the meaning of life is that God had a desire and that desire would be the saints of all the ages would praise Him and fellowship with Him for all eternity. In His perfect timing that will happen. Salvation in Jesus Christ is our, will be our common denominator. From Jew of the law who sacrificed an animal, as I told you, in faith of forgiveness outside of themselves, to those that were saved after the completion of the Bible, that have the full picture, all will be there. And Christian, let me just tell you, this needs to compel you. You've got something to live for tomorrow. You need to get out of your will and get into His will. You'd be looking forward to what He is going to do, what He wants to do. Some to strive for, some to look expectantly to. God has revealed them His mystery to you. You have a reservation to the party of parties, Christ Himself being the host. This is the meaning and the summation of all of history. God willed that a great multitude of people who had known the pains of sin and experienced the salvation of the grace of God would spend eternity praising and fellowshipping with Him. There's an old song, there's going to be a meeting in the air. In the sweet, sweet by and by. I'm going to be, meet you, greet you over there in the land beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear. T'will be glorious when we are there. And God's own Son will be the leading one in that meeting in the air. Angels could not fill the bill, seraphim and cherubim. The Lord certainly got bored of them soon. Animals could not do it. He didn't want to spend forever, pardon me, with cats and dogs. That would not do it. He wanted to spend eternity with you, those who He had ransomed and rescued, and those that could appreciate the grace of God. This is the mystery of His overall will that He made known in us, the gathering of all the children of grace. And that brings me to say in verse number 11, look at it, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. You have an inheritance in God's master will. Amen. You have a part of it, an inheritance in it. I've got a couple of rich uncles on my mother's side. When I was a little boy, there was one who started calling me Jake. Jake. You know how little boys do? Every Christmas, Uncle Jake would bring me something. And uh, he'd bring me a, a knife, or he'd bring me something. So I called him Uncle Jake. He called me Jake. And, you know, when I was a little boy, I thought, man, well, Uncle Jake, he's going to leave me millions and millions and millions of dollars. Well, since that time, Uncle Jake went bust, all right? He's not going to leave me anything, all right? He does collect tractors. I might get a tractor, you know? But please understand, we have an inheritance that is sure in heaven. We have an inheritance because He predestinated. That is how He would treat the saved soul. Look at the verse, in whom we, we also we have an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. You know why you have an inheritance? Because He decided that if you would trust on Jesus Christ, that's what you're going to get. It was His will to give you an inheritance. It was His will to lavish His love on you. That was His will. He, it was, wasn't His purpose that those that He would save would grovel forever, but rather to be exalted, sharing the glory and the beauty and the majesty of Jesus. We've already seen earlier messages that were co-heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Listen to the words of the Bible, Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, look at, that we may also be glorified together as Jesus Christ is lifted up and he will be lifted up in eternity you're going to be lifted up with him that's good that's better than all the self-esteem books and all the bookstores and all the borders around the world I'm going to be lifted up with Christ because he said it and he willed it
This inheritance is given to us in heaven as Christ is fully exalted over his enemies. He's raised up, we're raised up. Look over at chapter 2 and verse number 5 through 7. I love it. Even, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, that means makes us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved and hath raised us up together. That means raised you out of your sin and made us sit, look at this, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. He didn't only pull you out of sin. He, he raised you up out of sin. The picture of that is what? Yell it at baptism. Picture of coming up out of sin and up out of the grave. He lifted you up out of the grave and he kept on lifting you. And you are seated right now in heavenly places. You say I'm on 1842 Ots Chapel Road. No, you're not. You're on 1842 Glory Land. That's where you are. That's where I am. That's where I am seated in heavenly places. We need to get ourselves out of our earthly thinking to heavenly thinking. He has guaranteed us an eternal promotion with Christ in the heavenlies. His plan is in the fullness of the ages to come to show his exceeding riches of his grace towards us. To lavish. We're, we're going to be trophies of his grace. 40, 50, 60 million. I don't know how many we're going to be. All out there as a giant testimony to what God did. That he might receive the glory. All of us there that shouldn't be there. It's testimonies. Of his grace. Notice the way this is written in verse number 11. In whom, that is Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance. It's a done deal. It's past tense. You've already obtained an inheritance. Once again, don't tell me you can lose your salvation. You've already obtained it. You already have the inheritance. The check has already been written out to you. You have already cashed it. It is already yours. It won't be taken away from you. You have obtained the inheritance. It's a done deal. To the saved, our inheritance in heaven is past reality. We are just waiting to claim it. We need to think that way. The idea of an inheritance is an allotment or a gift given or a passing of possession from a father to the son. What does our inheritance include? I could list a million things, but being sinless, brand new bodies, seeing the Lord face to face, seeing loved ones passed on already, crowns and rewards for our labor, being able to praise God perfectly, a mansion, a white linen robe, the glories of being in heaven, eternal rest, an eternity to serve God perfectly. God tells us here that this reality is in past tense. It's already ours. It's already reserved for us. God doesn't function on linear time. To him, you are already seated in the heavenlies. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, look at this, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you. God doesn't lose reservations. He doesn't change the name on reservations. Our inheritance is secure. And it's God's desire that we would live enjoying that inheritance right now. And folks, I just want to close things down by saying this. Although it may seem, uh, it, it may seem as we talk about this, we want to be a little bit selfish and think about it. You notice a lot of the songs, even our hymnals and a lot of the gospel songs, are a little bit selfish concerning heaven. And we often think about our great luxury in heaven. And we think about, you know, how great it will be for us. And we think about, you know, it's going to be like a giant vacation or something. And the Bible speaks in Hebrews of a great rest. Please understand that is true. And it will be wonderful for us. But please understand something. We need to look at scripture here and see why we have received all these blessings in verse number 4 through 11. Why God is lavishing them on us. And let me just tell you what it is not like. It is not like a, ch ch a parent spoiling their child on Christmas morning. We, are you with me, amen section? This is my amen section up here. Are you with me? Some of them are out for the count. Sleep during the sermon, you don't get any dessert. All right. It's not like a parent with too much money or too, much, too many credit cards who are giving their children a million things in Christmas. It's not like that. So that they can see their children enjoy all the things that they never had. It's not like that at all. That's not what heaven is like. What is the real reason that God predestined these things? What was the purpose and the will in making you holy and without blame before him in love, an adopted child, accepted in the beloved, redeemed by Jesus' blood, knowing the mystery of his will and giving you inheritance? Are all these things, these rich things for your pleasure? Is man the focal point of the universe? 
Do we really believe in our infinite antness? That's a new word, that we're ants. In our antness, that we are the focal point like spoiled brats in heaven? Is the salvation of wicked man the meaning of history and God's top agenda? No. Look at verse number 11, the last part. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Let that sink in. Yes, we all have these lavish things on us for all eternity, but what is the reason? What is the meaning of this great 40, 50, 60 million strong to the praise of his glory? Folks, we are not the center of the universe. The praise of God's glory is. It's the center of the universe and time and the meaning of all things. It may be hard for you to conceive uh, uh, because it is sin for man to have pride, but the greatest plan of salvation, the lavishing of salvation gifts on us, is primarily for God to be praised and exalted in eternity. That he had mercy on vessels of clay and helpless, wicked rebels. It makes no sense. It's an unthinkable love for the perfect one, the perfect one, the all-powerful one, the one who has never done anything wrong, who has millions and billions in the riches of heaven, who cannot be contained in the universe. It is unthinkable that he would have mercy on a wicked worm like you and like me. And what the greatest glory that it could ever come to him, listen to me, got to get this, the greatest glory that could ever come to him is if that amazingly great God would condescend to the worms of wickedness and lift them out of the miry clay and exalt them together with him not because of anything they did, but only because of His love and His grace. That is the mystery of His will throughout all the ages, and forever will stand there, rejoice and praise Him, and all the universe will sing His praises Amen. for what He has done. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love and your mercy and your grace.